Great to be here. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, everybody. What a joy, as always, to be with you. Familiar names and faces and new ones as well. Um, and thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, so much to talk about this week. Let's jump in to our Parsha. Our Parsha begins kind of on a cliffhanger. It's like when I was in like seventh and eighth grade, I watched soap operas. There was a big Days of Our Lives kid in middle school. And I was always, I always loved the like, the way a show would end on Friday on a cliffhanger and you have to wait the whole weekend. And so Monday's show uh, began right in the middle of the scene, the Friday ended. Well, that's how our Parsha is. Um, that after a flurry of, of activity last week, we end right in the middle of a scene. Um, our Parsha will similarly end that way. It's a really epic, uh, epic story. And where our Parsha begins is that our protagonist, Yosef, is in prison. And, you know, all the good looks and charisma and talents in the world have not saved him from being um, a, uh, a migrant against his will, enslaved, incarcerated by people who are in power. Um, and he learns what so many poor people, immigrants, members of unfavored ethnic groups learn living in powerful empires. Truth doesn't matter in the justice system. He was framed for something he didn't do, for sexual assault that he didn't do. In fact, he was assaulted. Um, he was blamed for it and he had no recourse, no legal defense. Um, you know, the last line of last week's Parsha highlighted Yosef's abandoned and seemingly hopeless state. So he had one potential friend. He had befriended and impressed his two prison mates, the former chief butler and former chief baker of the Egyptian empire, the Egyptian throne. And as he predicted in his dream interpretation, the chief butler in three days time would be released and returned to his post. And Yosef asked him, please, when that happens, please remember me. So um, here, I'm going to share the, uh, the source sheet that we're going to be using. I'll try not to share my screen too much so we can look at each other. You can open it up um, as you would like to. Here's a link to the document, but I'll share a screen for a moment. And just just so we can see the stark arrangement, the very end of last week's Parsha leaves us with that thud. Yet the chief butler did not remember Yosef, but forgot him. Sort of parallel, but not remembering, but forgetting. And that's where we've been sitting for a week on the Parsha break. And then at the beginning of this week, Vayihi, it's often a word that um, transitions to some passage of time, the next major event after a lull. It happened at the end of two years' time. Pharaoh dreams, and look, he's standing on the Nile, etc., etc., etc. No long narrative of his dream, and he's vexed, and all his wise people can't successfully interpret the dream in a way that is resonant for him. And then the butler's like, oh, you know, there was this guy probably still in prison two years ago was really good at interpreting dreams you should check him out and that's when pharaoh summons him yosef interprets the dreams satisfactorily in a way that is resonant with pharaoh's experience of the dream and yosef uh, boldly an act of sacred chutzpah suggests you know you probably want to hire somebody to start you know, rationing the food for the next seven years of plenty so that there will be a store. And then Pharaoh's like, you know, wow, who, who could ever be so wise? You know, it's got to be you. So his fortunes really change. Um, this is where we've been sitting. I want us to actually dwell in that break and in Yosef's experience, though before we jump forward. There's so much feverish activity, and sh no matter how many times we've read it, shocking activity 
in the Parsha, that it's sometimes easy to forget what's kind of glossed over. We don't get a ton of narrative of Yosef's experience incarcerated. And yet, the rabbis really emphasize Yosef's experience of incarceration and liberation from it as one of the major events events of Jewish and global history. Um, we'll see in a moment that like they figure out or locate Yosef's um, liberation from prison as being on Rosh Hashanah. That's something that we're supposed to do on Rosh Hashanah. We're marking Yosef's freeing from prison. So we'll get to that in a moment. But I just want to like frame that this part is an opportunity to think about prison. Think about the Jewish Torah framing and experience of what prison is. Um, for those of us who are in the United States, we live in a country that incarcerates more people numerically and per capita than any country in world history. You could say that the prison system, the experience of prison is the most American feature of America in terms of what most distinguishes us from other countries. And so as Jewish people, this is the Parsha that really invites us to reflect on um, what we make of the experience of prison as something, uh, a Parsha that tells us that this is a personal experience for us. Um, how long Yosef was in prison is not totally clear. We know he was 17 when he sold into slavery, and we know that he's 30 when he is hired by Pharaoh. So there are 13 years in between. We don't know how long he was in Potiphar's house, you know, when he was uh, assaulted and framed by Potiphar's wife. Was he just like 18 and it happened pretty quickly after he was there, or had he built up a lot of success there? And um, we know that he's in prison at least two years, more than two years, because um, it's two years after his conversation with the butler and the baker that Pharaoh has his dreams. So those were two years. And he seems to have already risen in the ranks of the prison before that event with the butler and the baker. So I don't know, probably somewhere between three years and 12, he's in prison. One particular tradition, the Midrash, uh, the medieval Midrashic work called Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, that's very interested in dating and things. Um, says, you know, the woman, Potiphar's wife, brought slanderous charges against him to kill him, and he was incarcerated in prison for 10 years. So that's Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer's framing. If I remember correctly, Midrash and Shemot Rabbah has it as 12. Some other traditions have it shorter than that. Let's say 10 years. He was in, in jail for 10 years. No, nobody to visit him. Nobody to write him letters. No lawyer. Nobody advocating on his behalf. It doesn't matter that he comes from a wealthy family, that they're in a different country, they think he's dead. It doesn't matter that he's good looking and charismatic. Nobody's paying attention. Yosef's experience in prison really highlights that. Um, the uh, the myth of a meritocracy um, and how much is contingent on power. Um, we see this really played out when Yosef is freed and Pharaoh says to Yosef after his brilliant, uh, divinely inspired interpretation of the dream, um, Pharaoh says, since God has made all this known to you, there is none so discerning and wise as you. Now, Yosef has had that divine insight, that bina, that chokhmah, that insight, that wisdom, the whole time. Nobody was paying attention. It's actually um, something close to dumb luck that his skills have been noticed now. I want us to just pause and recognize that perhaps the Torah is inviting us to think about all the people whom, whom uh, the, the penal system wants us to, uh, wants to render invisible from us and remind us everyone there has various skills, talents. We don't know what potential geniuses are in every local jail, state and federal penitentiary. 
um, etc. So I think that's what the Torah is inviting us to. That's at least how do we grapple with the close call of Yosef's experience. What was, what did we almost miss with Yosef? What happens if the dumb luck um, of Pharaoh having a dream and the butler having been there um, doesn't open those doors to Yosef? Um, okay, I'm just gonna check the chat for a moment. Not interested in this liberal politics explanation of the Torah. Great, like alternative readings are welcome if you think that um, we're misreading anything. Well, I just ask you to think, what do you make of uh, Chazal centering of this experience and of the Torah focusing on it? We're going to commit to the reader of the entry. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, let us pause and take a couple of questions for um, before we look into the rabbinic material about um, the significance of Yosef's um, uh, redemption from from slavery. We'll have a, a from from incarceration. A couple of people want to share um, observations or thoughts about um, what do you think? What would you make? of this focus of the experience. Why does the Torah want to pass us through the experience of, uh, of seeing you safe, considering you safe in prison? Um, I see hands from Ginger and Joyce. Why don't we take those two and then we'll move forward. Ginger? That's okay. I accidentally raised my hand, but thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Joyce Lynn and then Alan Gale. Go ahead. Oh, there. Hi. Uh, I also like to think of this as how our own thoughts imprison us. Uh, he, Joseph is in a physical prison but some of us are imprisoned by what our, our thoughts, our fears, our own emotions. And I, uh, it would be interesting to trace how his freedom came about as, a, as maybe a, perhaps a roadmap for our own liberation. Uh, I mean, it's pretty clear when we uh, celebrate Passover and to apply this thought process. But uh, it's interesting that he was freed on Rosh Hashanah, the new year. Uh, anyway, you can just continue. In yeah. That, in that Thanks, Joyce. Yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. And, you know, I, I think that's a really important observation. And the only, the only thing, pause I want to give is that I, I definitely think, and our tradition is rich with using the physical experience of incarceration as a jumping off point to understand other things that can be compared to it, that are continuous with it. Um, and for in a culture that invisibilizes people who are experiencing incarceration and in social environments that are not integrating people who have had that physical experience, there can be a tendency to jump straight to metaphor and only to metaphor. And I think the metaphor actually loses some of, it, some of its oomph, some of its meaning, when we're not actually starting with the literal, the, the literal physical experience. I think the metaphor really derives its power and its depth when we're seriously in touch with, um, with what's at stake in the literal. So thanks for opening that up. We're going to be um, expanding and, and narrowing our lens as we go, we'll jump forward in a minute. We'll take Alan's comment and question, and then actually we'll move forward and see a few more things. And Alan, Howard, and Tanya, you can hold on to your comments and questions. We'll, we'll have time in a few minutes to come back to so that. There's a, so there's a major concept of Pidyon Shvuim, which I don't think existed at this time. Nobody was there to free uh, Yosef, um, and yet it became a major concept in Judaism. And today, you know, to relate it to America, I mean, we've got a couple of million people in prison. And are we, are we sure that, they're all, that they all belong there? I mean, you know, there, I, I believe there, there's at least one Jewish organization 
that works to free prisoners who are unjustly imprisoned. So I, I think it's important to relate that concept to this portion. Thanks, Alan. Um, and Alan Howard, Tanya, and Happy will come back to your questions in, uh, in a few minutes or comments. Um, I want to show you a few more sources and then we'll have like a good opportunity to, uh, to expand some comments and discussion a little bit. Um, so you can keep the hands raised so we remember you. Um, there's one comment in the chat that I do want to relate to. I believe it was Jeanette, I think, um, pushed back against my framing as dumb luck. And I think that's really, that's really welcome. Um, uh, I think there was a bit of a theatrical framing to, to call it dumb luck. However, it's in the, in the, in the Torah's presentation, it's certainly not exclusively dumb luck. I mean, there's divine, divine intervention, divine inspiration. The Torah describes Yosef as having, um, a divinely given gift of dream interpretation. And Yosef emphasizes that, especially more, most explicitly to Pharaoh, Hey, you know, I'm just a conduit. It's God who interprets the dreams. However, where I can where I can push back a little bit, Janet, is that the Torah doesn't say that Pharaoh's dream was implanted by God for this purpose. It doesn't say it wasn't, but it doesn't say that that was all a big plot by God. In other words, what is God-given is that Yosef is given gifts and talents. In this particular case, dream interpretation and insight. The Torah leaves us to wonder, could somebody with such a divine gift have been left to languish all these years? I mean, according to Chazal, he was left to languish for 10 years, not having redemption because of it. Um, and it leaves us to wonder what his dream when he woke up. Or what if oh, that day? It doesn't say that God was controlling to make sure that none of the wise men's interpretation was satisfactory to Pharaoh. So I think the Torah might be inviting us to consider um, whether there's an aspect of, of dumb luck that anybody who is incarcerated um, can have. And maybe what's special about Yosef is jumping at an opportunity and being blessed with a divine gift of, of insight, which might be true to, in different ways of different people incarcerated. That's where the Torah leaves us um, wondering. So I want to move forward um, in the source sheet. Um, so again, this, you can open it on your own. I'm not going to share the screen here, but famous, famous rabbinic passage, um, Talmud Bavli, Masechet Rosh Hashanah. Um, thank you, Julie. Uh, 10b to 11b. It's a long passage, a famous baraita, famous Tanaitic source recorded in, in the Talmud, a massive machloket dispute between Rabbi Yezer and Rabbi Yoshua, two second century titans of uh, rabbinic interpretation, um, real shapers of what becomes the Mishnah, about how to date epic events in the history of the world. So it starts with Rabbi Yezer taught that in Tishrei, the world was created. In Tishrei, the patriarchs were born. In Tishrei, the patriarchs died. On Pesach, Yitzchak was born. On Rosh Hashanah, Sarah, Rachel, and Hannah were remembered, meaning they were uh, um, became pregnant. Um, on Rosh Hashanah, Yosef came out of prison. On Rosh Hashanah, Yatza Yosef mi Beit Asurin. On Rosh Hashanah, our ancestors' labor in Egypt ceased. Remember, there's this period during the plagues of several months where Egypt's in free fall um, before they get out. In Nisan, the month of Pesach, the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt. In Tishrei, the future, the Jewish people will be redeemed. Rabbi Yoshua has a different timeline. It's in Nisan that the world was created. In Nisan, the patriarchs were born. In Nisan, the patriarchs died. 
On Pesach, Yitzchak was born. They agree about that. On Rosh Hashanah, Sarah, Rachel, and Chana were remembered. They agree on that. On Rosh Hashanah, Yosef came out from prison. They agree on that. On Rosh Hashanah, our ancestors labor and Egypt ceased. They agree on that. In Nisan, etc. So there's a dispute about really, you know, when the world was created and when the patriarchs were born and died. Part of the question being like, I think the, what, what, what's at stake when we ask when the world was created is that like, is the history of the universe fundamentally um, always preordained to be focused on the mythic experience of the Jewish people? The world is born in Nisan as a, all of creation as a precursor to the Israelite experience of liberation, or does the world have kind of its own history and grammar behind it? And that both opinions are widespread. What for our purposes today, both of them agree on Rosh Hashanah, Yosef came out from prison. That is an agreed upon um, date. I want to note there are two things that are significant about this. One is that Yosef's liberation from prison is singled out to be this epically important event on the level of the creation of the world, the birthdays of the patriarchs, the death of the patriarchs, um, the uh, 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 miraculous impregnation of three barren foremothers, um, redemption from Egyptian slavery. That's interesting. That might not be obvious. Um, maybe it is obvious to some people, but I just want to note that, that like Yosef's liberation from prison at the beginning of this week's Parsha is singled out as one of the epic events like that. And secondly, it's connected with Rosh Hashanah. The Gemara gives us an explanation for why. Um, from where do we have this? You scroll down to the bottom of this box after the ellipsis, it quotes that part of the Baraita. Um, Barosh Hashanah Yatsami Beit Asurim Minala. Where did we learn this from? What's the source? Dichtiv, as it is written, Psalms 81. Sound a shofar at the new moon. Tik Ubachoda Shofar. This is a passage that. We read prominently in the liturgy around the shofar service on Rosh Hashanah. Um, it's where we take the language of Yerush Hashanah Day Kiddush from, um, and a lot of midrashim about understanding the events of Rosh Hashanah from this these verses. So Tiku Bachoda Shofar on the new month, on the new moon, sound a shofar at the covered time of our festival day, Bekesa Liom Chagenu, a day of hidden things. For this is the law of Israel, Kichok Israel, Humishbat Yaakov, etc. Verse 6 He imposed it as a decree upon Joseph when he went forth from the land of Israel. I heard a language that I knew not. Um, so, this is the decree or the ordained for Joseph as testimony when he went out over Egypt. So, we've already said we've the fact that the psalm associates Joseph entering Egypt or going out over Egypt with sounding a shofar at the new moon is a link to say that Joseph's departure into the world happened on Rosh Hashanah um, and his teaching of languages, etc. I want to like just emphasize something about this. Rosh Hashanah is processed as Yom Hadin, the Day of Judgment. And I think some one aspect of our processing of Yom Hadin is the experience of fear of punishment. As we do an accounting of our sins between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we stand in judgment on Rosh Hashanah, pleading with God to move from the seat of judgment to the seat of compassion. The Talmud is saying something radical and I think very interesting here, that Yom Hadin is in its origins, Judgment Day in its origin, is the day of release from prison, not a day of imprisonment. I wonder, we can open it up to add to previous questions, what does it do to our conceptions of, of Rosh Hashanah? For Chazal to tell us that the Tanakh is telling us that Rosh Hashanah is fundamentally a day 
of liberation of moving out into the world. Let's take about five minutes of question and discussion, and then we'll move forward to a few other texts. So I believe um, Tanya and Howard, and then uh, Happy, I think, was next, and then we'll see where we are after that. Go ahead, Tanya. Well, Rabbi, uh, the point I want to make throughout this whole Torah portion is that Joseph was an other in this society. He was one of the other people. He was a Hebrew, and that's mentioned several times throughout the, uh, the Joseph narratives, and I think that had a lot to do with his imprisonment also. Great. Thank you, Tanya. And I see a question from, uh, from Mitt. How did they calculate that Joseph was released from uh, from prison in Rosh Hashanah. This one actually isn't a calculation. It's an interpretation of those verses from Psalms. That the Psalm that's about Rosh Hashanah, Tiku Bachore Shofar Bekeseliyam Chagenu, sound the shofar at the new moon on the hidden day. And then right after that says, This was ordained as a day, the day that Joseph went out uh, teaching language to the people, etc. So, um, so that connection that the Psalm makes. The rabbis interpret all the, the, the unanimously interpret that this means that Joseph's coming out day was on Rosh Hashanah. Um, thanks for that comment, to Tanya. Um, right, Joel says the name Rosh Hashanah is not mentioned in the Torah. Right, what we're calling Rosh Hashanah, and what the rabbis call Rosh Hashanah um, in the Torah, it's Yom Teruah on the first day of the seventh month. The Psalm here, or Yom Zichron Teruah, the Psalm here says. Tiku Bachodesh Shofar, which maybe just that means every Rosh Chodesh, every first new moon, like this Sunday, you know, blow the shofar. Um, that hasn't been how it's been interpreted, you know, since it's been the day of Trua, the day of shofar, um, specifically on this new moon. That's how it's been taken. Um, thanks for your comment, Tanya. Um, uh, Howard, Marks, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, just two observations. Uh, about his time in prison, um, it's clear that he was in a minimum security prison. I, I say that for a number of reasons. First of all, he emerged after whatever time he was incarcerated um, in pretty good shape physically and mentally. Um, there's no indication that he was uh, beaten or injured. He emerged uh, to join, the, to be this number two person in Egypt. So that's the first thing. The, th the second thing is he was able to converse with the uh, chief butler and with the cook, certainly in a uh, solitary confinement or in a maximum security prison. Those conversations are not permitted. I'm sure they weren't permitted back then. Certainly they're not permitted today. And I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the third thing is that uh, it just seems he was well treated. Uh, that's not to say that confinement is ever easy. Um, it's hell. Um, but so I, I think that that's one of the fun things about studying Torah is that we're able to fill in the blanks. Yeah. And, uh, sort of, you know, so yeah, I really appreciate that, Howard. He's, yeah, he's definitely not in solitary confinement, for sure. Um, I mean, maximum security prisons, prisoner in, in, incarcerated people still have social relationships with each other in conversations, but he's certainly not in solitary which is a major part of our, of our penal system. Um, and so it's interesting that even in what seems to be, you know, uh, we, we don't see evidence of a lot of physical abuse um, or malnutrition that are very common in contemporary penal systems that we're aware of. And even so, even in a perhaps more humane incarceration system, um, given those uh, um, speculative, um, but I think uh, warranted observations. Um, even so, Chazal view his release from prison as this massive event of mythic significance. The fact of freedom denied of being incarceration is framed as this major, major imposition, even in conditions that might not be anywhere near as bad as things that we've come to um, accept as normal, and that all of us pay for regularly um, and build our economy around. So thanks for making that observation. Happy, and then Ellen, and then we're going to jump back to the text. Hello. Um, 
I am so moved and excited to hear the comment that if we go too far with metaphor without paying attention to the literal, we can actually miss out. And I think that Joseph's interpretation of dreams is, would be more like a metaphor. However, it was through that metaphor that he eventually became in charge of something very literal, sustenance, survival, how to manage the food. And I think that that relationship between metaphor and literal is kind of the purpose of studying Torah. And um, I, I think that somewhere in that um, actualization of taking action that sustains life, in this story, all of it becomes possible when his enemy or his persecutor releases him from prison. And so there's this kind of invitation or requirement that we be heard and seen by even the people who perhaps shut us down or incarcerate us. And I want to stop talking to not use up too much time, but it's very similar to the events that bring us to Hanukkah. Thank you for that connection, Happy. Yeah, um, I won't. I don't need to add anything onto that. Thank you for sharing that. Ellen, go ahead. Thank you. I want to take this uh, story and take a look at it from the point of view of someone who has read the story. And it was a major life turning point. Uh, I worked uh, on someone's behalf who was first a lawyer. Uh, this all takes place in another country. They became a law professor. Then they went on for their PhD in one of the medical fields. And the government regulators uh, got a hold of his research. And it, obvious, it had an obvious uh, conflict with one of the manufacturers and com their commercial interests. A lot of heat was pressed on him, false charges. He was imprisoned. Um, he was uh, not treated well. Uh, the story ends that uh, he, this, the middle of the story is that he asked for um, a copy of the Torah. He, he was a different faith. And he started questioning with this story how his response to his um, oppressors should be. And the strength of this story became the strength of his story so that he was able to escape. That's a whole nother uh, story. It could be a movie. He came to the United States. That's a whole nother story. It could be a movie. He was an Uber driver. Um, and then the rest of it is that he was um, uh, accepted by a synagogue. And that's when I came to work with him. So he's back in his field in the medical sciences. Um, it is such a strong story and the reception of this story to someone who was themselves incarcerated in a different country has a whole arc to it. So while we're looking at it in terms of our own personal reception to the story, there's many stories where someone has used it to lift and uh, be liberated in both a literal, thank you, happy, and a uh, metaphorical sense. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. I really appreciate that that comment. It's it's a, a, a key reminder that when we study Torah, uh, we're not escaping. It's not an oasis from life. It's a book about the hardest things that are actually happening in our lives. So thanks for making that connection. Um, if you look at the back of the source sheet, um, I'm not going to share my screen for this. I want to still see each other's faces, but you can uh, scroll to it at the bottom of that page. Talmud Bavli Brachot 54b. Um, we have a very important halacha that might be, you know, pretty well known um, from people who, um, from Shabbat services or, or other times. Rav Yehuda said that Rav said. So the the very beginning of post Mishnaic Talmudic 
Law, there are four categories of people who must offer thanks. One is seafarers, your day hayam. Two is those who walk in the desert, people who have gone on a long journey. Three, one who was ill and recovered. And four, one who was incarcerated in prison and went out. So what blessing does one recite? If these four categories of people have, have, are required to give blessing, to give thanks, Rav Yehuda says the blessing is Baruch Gomel Chasadim Tovim. Praised is Adonai, our king, etc., who bestows acts of love and kindness. Um, and Abaye adds uh, a few generations later uh, that one must offer that thanks before 10 people, for the uh, you know, the microcosm of the entire Jewish people, the community, the congregation, as it is said, Psalms 107, let them exalt God also in the congregation of the people. Um, these are categories of people who had a brush with death. Traveling on the sea is always considered um, dangerous to life. Um, walking in the desert without oases is always dangerous. Somebody who had a serious illness and recovered, didn't know if they were going to live, and one who was incarcerated in prison and went out. Um, prison is always a threat to life itself, even you know in conditions less severe than the conditions that we've come to understand as normal in our context. Um, um, so regardless of whether they were released or escaped from prison, the, the Talmud doesn't distinguish there. Um, but being alive and safe for people with experiences like these is just not continuous with life the day before in the ways that it is for everybody else. It's a rupture. Leaving prison, as your safe did, is a rupture. It's a rebirth because in those conditions, death was always lurking. And I think it's important. This halakha is asking us to remember the prison, like serious illness, like travel through a dangerous area, um, is always prison is always a contingent capital punishment. And you know we're still in a, noticing that if you look at the highest rates of what are the locations with the highest uh, rates of COVID infection and death, many of the of the hotspots were jails. Cook County Jail in, here in Chicago was one of the highest um, hotspots of COVID, uh, in, especially in 2020, 2021, COVID um, infection and death. Also slaughterhouses, factory farms, and, uh, and nursing homes. Um, but all the rest are incarceration facilities. Um, so that's, you know, that's true now, and it's a phenomenon that's been true for generations, and that Chazal are, reminding us that coming out of prison requires um, a special, unusual blessing and capturing the feeling that life feels, in that case, not natural, but supernatural. And I wonder if Abaye's requirement that this be said publicly and not just privately upon release is that the public person needs, the person needs that public affirmation to verify that they're truly and not just metaphorically alive. And the community maybe needs to confront some hard truths about mortality more widely by hearing and validating the dangerous experiences that would be more convenient to kind of hide in the shadows, not comfortable to talk about illness, talk about danger, and especially to talk about prison. Um, and, you know, this burden doesn't just fall on those who have survived these trials, because the liturgy incorporates it into everybody's experience. If you scroll down, God's identity is one who frees prisoners. Psalm 146, which we say in Sukkot Zimmer every morning, the beginning of the five hallelujah psalms. God is the one who does justice for those who are wrong, gives food to the hungry. Adonai frees prisoners. Adonai matir asurim, and Adonai restores sight to the blind, stands up for those who are bent, loves the righteous. This gets incorporated into our daily Birkota Shachar. Every single one of us, when we get up in the morning, we have we incorporate these into a series of brachot, one of which is, "Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, Cosmic Majesty." To use Rav Zalman Shachter Shalomi's, um, I think, uh, really insightful framing of Melech Haolam. Haolam is both physical and temporal space, captured by the word cosmic. God matir asurim, praised are you, God who frees prisoners. Now there is a metaphorical aspect to this. While we're sleeping. 
you know, from sudden infant death sy syndrome to heart attacks in one sleep. Sleep is a vulnerable position and our limbs are not moving, not demonstrating vitality. And there's a metaphorical aspect of when we sit up in our, in our bed, we are, we're not bound in the way we were before when we were sleeping. But that metaphor only derives currency from the physical experience of liberation from incarceration. We have to understand what liberation from incarceration is in order to tap into why it's not a waste of the divine name to praise God for freeing prisoners even when we get up. Every day, each one of us could be an incarcerated person. Um, the rabbis in the Midrash and Sifrei, the early classic Midrash, say that you get like a, an early an early sketch of what the rest of prayer could look like. Even the 18 blessings, the Amida, that the first prophets established for Israel to pray every day, they didn't open with the needs of Israel until they opened with the praise of God, the great, mighty, and awesome God. El HaGadol HaGibor V'Hanarab. Say that in the introduction. Holy are you new and awesome is your name, which was the, the Girsa at that time. Afterward, who releases the bound, Matir Asurim, and the second blessing, and afterward, who heals the sick, Rofei Cholim, and we are grateful for you. Only later do we get to those requests after we praise God's might and God who releases the bound. That's from the second blessing of the Amidah. We also say this. And, you know, so much hand-wringing in liberal Judaism in the 20th century, the very prosaic 20th century, was over the framing of this blessing as God resurrecting the dead. Do we believe in resurrection of the dead? Mordechai Kaplan, whole thing. It's a change in Mechaia Akol, life giving to everything. But I think a lot of that 20th century discussion missed the fact that the, the foundational metaphor in this is not about resurrection of the dead, but about liberating the incarcerated people. Your cosmically mighty God, life giver of the dead, abundant in salvation, wins or do. Sustainer of the living with loving kindness, life giver to the dead. How do we know that? So, supporter of the fallen, healer of the sick, freer of the imprisoned. God frees incarcerated people. And the Midrash is framing it, that's really the essence of that blessing. The first blessing we praise God is the great, mighty, and awesome God. And the second blessing we praise God is the one who frees imprisoned people. And finally, just to close, uh, I know we're a minute over, um, that this isn't just God's praise, but it's also what it means to be a Jewish person. Isaiah chapter 42, one of the most famous passages of the prophets, um, God speaks through the prophet saying, I, Adonai, in my grace have summoned you, karatich abetzedek, I've grasped you by the hand, I've created you, speaking to the Jewish people, and appointed you as a covenant people. Etencha livrit am, a light of nations, l'or goyim. What does it mean to be a chosen people, to be a light to the nations, which comes from this passage? Opening eyes deprived of light, rescuing prisoners from confinement. From the dungeon, those who sit in darkness. What it means to be a Jewish person, chosen person, in covenant with God, is to mimic and emulate God's identity as one who frees incarcerated people. The day that a person is incarcerated from, from freedom, from, from prison, is a day of acknowledging. Um, the possibility of resurrection of the dead, of God's intervention in the world, of God's greatness, a miracle worthy of imagining the creation of the universe. And I'll leave it at there. Wish everybody a happy and joyous Hanukkah, Hanukkah Sameach, um, and Shabbat Shalom. Stay warm and safe, everybody, and I'll turn it back to Julie.